Recently, I picked up and read a copy of Cal Newport's recent book, Digital Minimalism. And as someone who's always kind of been aware of my relationship with technology and how it might not be optimal and it might be detrimental. I mean, one of the first videos I made on this channel was uh, an essay talking about nomophobia, the fear of being without a phone. Do I really want to spend most of my waking hours staring into a screen that ultimately just devours my self-control, my attention span, my ability to connect? The, the concept of the book had a tremendous appeal to me. As I was reading the book, however, the, the first part had some really radical claims about what he calls iGen or Generation Z, people who have grown up only knowing smartphones. And, you know, I, I wanted to find the data to back that up because I believe that all radical claims require radical evidence. If you're going to say that the sky is falling, you better have some pretty good evidence for that. If you're going to say that a generation is being destroyed, you better have some pretty good evidence for that. What I found, though, when I went digging, was data that told a completely different narrative. A narrative that disagreed entirely with the premise of Cal Newport's book and of other articles and books written by many contemporary authors. So the purpose of this video then is just to talk about that data and why the rationale that these authors are using is flawed. And in a future video, I'm actually gonna double back on what I'm saying and say even though the rationale that they're using is flawed, the recommendations that they're making from it are actually really solid. But I'm going to back it up with, with rationale that seems to actually agree with the data, at least in my opinion. But that's going to be a future video. For now, let's dive into the evidence. So the main issue that I'm taking here is an article in The Atlantic that Newport cites called Are Smartphones Destroying a Generation? by Jean Twench. And in the subtext, she says that uh, adolescents are on the verge of a mental health crisis. I want to be clear that, that Twenge actually does make some pretty compelling points uh, and uses data to back them up. So the three points that I thought were compelling were uh, that teenagers are getting more likely to feel lonely, to, to associate with statements like, I feel lonely sometimes or all the time. So that's happening more over time as smartphones uh, were introduced. Uh, another is that teenagers are uh, more likely to, to not get enough sleep. Um, that's another thing. We've seen an uptick, uh, or rather a downtick, in how much teens are likely to spend time with friends. And there are a few other pieces of, of evidence that she gives. She says that teens are less likely to drive, they're less likely to go on dates, less likely to have sex. Um, but those, I think, are weaker because they're really kind of historical trends that maybe have been catalyzed by the introduction of smartphones, but definitely not caused by them. We see this kind of downwards trend and then a downtick, um, but, but that's not the causation, right? It just might have sped it up a little bit. So this is kind of the data that, uh, that Newport and Twenge are relying on, kind of these six pieces, but really these three pieces of data. Um, so I guess, you know, the question is, I've already admitted that they're, they're solid pieces of data, that the trend exists. So where's my beef? Like, like what, what do I take issue with in their point? <laughs> So where I'm really taking issue is that they're using these indicators, like loneliness, um, as, as indicators of overall mental health, when we have better measures of that. So when Twen just says that, that teens are on the verge of a mental health crisis, right, that sounds worrying. But when we analyze the actual data for mental health diagnoses in America with adolescents, we find that smartphones and social media have had no measurable impact on diagnoses. It's remained the same since 2004, give or take very small deviations. Obviously, somebody can have a mental condition such as anxiety and it not be diagnosed. In fact, that's <laughs> in, in some estimations, uh, most mental uh, conditions go undiagnosed. But for the narrative to be true, that teenagers or, or people in general are becoming more anxious because of smartphones and because of social media, then what that would mean is for anxiety uh, and, and other mental condition diagnoses to remain the same, doctors and mental health professionals would have to be actively getting worse at diagnosing them. We would have to actively be ignoring more and more people who are experiencing anxiety symptoms and other mental health symptoms in order for that number to stay the same. And to me, that narrative doesn't make sense. I don't know for sure, so I can't make any radical claim about that. But when I think about what's happened in the past, you know, decade and a half since the inception of Facebook, 
what we're looking at is, is movements like Bell Let's Talk, right? Where it becomes more comfortable for people to have conversations about mental health. We're seeing huge leaps and bounds. So, you know, an alternative thesis for why teenagers are identifying more with phrases like, I feel lonely sometimes, is because it's safer for them to do so in the current environment. That's a critical point. We can't assign this causality. We can't say, you know, in 2012, 50% of teenagers had smartphones and oh, look at that, there's an uptick. We have to consider kind of the environmental factors around that as well, the social factors. It's so complex what causes a teenager to feel lonely that you can't just draw this radical claim and then say that teenagers are on a mental health crisis because they're using their phones more. So it's pretty clear to me that there is no impending mental health crisis, okay? Because the data just doesn't support that on diagnoses. And no one's shown me compelling data that we're actually getting worse at, at diagnosing mental illness. If, if someone were to show me that data, I'd totally revise my point. I'm not set in stone on this. I'm not trying to promote that narrative. But What's compelling to me also is, is happiness, okay? So when you look at subjective well-being, you would think that if a generation is being ruined, their well-being would be lower, right? They would feel worse. But if you look at studies over time, you'll find that adolescents today are happier than adolescents in previous generations. Their well-being is higher. Now, one might also bring up the fact that you can actually correlate heightened anxiety levels with heightened social media usage and heightened social media usage again with, with lower uh, levels of happiness. But I would hypothesize that maybe the causality for this is backwards. Maybe people who are struggling with anxiety go on social media more. So this is just anecdotally speaking, but I'm someone who has struggled with anxiety and, and does struggle with anxiety. And when I'm going through a tough episode, I will be on my phone, on social media, sometimes upwards of eight hours a day. Obviously, you know, not proud of that, but it's true. And the fact that's important here is that I had these episodes well before I had a smartphone. And the smartphone for me is, is like a, a coping mechanism, if you will. It's kind of a, a symptom of a, of a greater problem, which is, you know, anxiety. And is it the greatest solution to it? No. So there's definitely a feedback mechanism in there, which is, you know, I'm feeling anxious. I go on my phone. My phone makes me more anxious. But the initial causality is anxiety and then phone, not phone and then anxiety, at least for me. And it might be different for other people. I don't know. I haven't seen the data on actual causality with this because it's very hard to separate those two things out. So I'd be interested to see a study on that, but I haven't seen one. And so I think people maybe need to think a little bit deeper in this matter about the complexity of correlation versus causation. So after seeing all of this data, both that which is presented by Twenge and, and, and that which is presented by myself, it would be hard to argue the case that the situation isn't more complex than the narrative commonly promoted in the media, right? Because teens are, are lonelier, but no more anxious. And they're less likely to spend time with friends, but they're happier. I mean, no matter how I, I think about this, there is no simple claim that can be made for these correlations and for the causation of them. And I'm not gonna make any sweeping claims. I'm not gonna make any, you know, major thesis here because uh, unlike Twenge, you know, I, I believe that, that in order to promote a radical opinion on a subject which, you know, is ubiquitous in our lives, smartphones are used by a vast majority of people in America now, that we should have radical evidence to back up why. It is oversimplified to say that smartphones are destroying a generation, just like it would be oversimplified to say that smartphones are not having an impact on a generation. The fact of the matter is, the studies right now aren't showing any clear narrative, and they're not mature enough for us to draw any radical conclusions from them. So I want to end this by saying that Newport doesn't actually need to rely on this, this faulty narrative in order for the philosophy and uh, the practices that he promotes in digital minimalism to hold water, to, to be valuable. In a nutshell, digital minimalism is the intentional limiting of technology to only the behaviors and products that promote that which you deeply value. I think that this is a really good philosophy for thinking about how we should interact with technology. But I want to propose an alternative framework for how we can justify this, or why it's important to think about technology in this way. And I call this framework intentional attention. But this video is getting long, and like I said, I'm going to talk about that in a future video. 
So if you thought this video was compelling and you want to hear more, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so that uh, you get notified when this video comes out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this matter as well. Is there something that I'm missing here? Because I'm more than willing to kind of change my opinion. If someone can present a compelling narrative, I'm more than willing to listen. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Um, if you liked it, you know, feel free to like. Uh, and I will see you very shortly with part two to this video um, where I talk about intentional attention. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.